I'm going to share something with y'all. That might put me in a very negative light, yeah. Relationships are not my forte. You see if someone grabbed up my wife and saying, completely different ball game. I'll walk away from it, and this has been like a therapy session. Hello and welcome to Raw The Fight Within podcast with me, Coogan Cassius. Absolutely delighted to have Mr. Roy Jones Jr., uh, Boxing Elite, um, on this podcast. Roy, thank you very much for agreeing to come on here. How are you, first of all? I'm good, brother. How are you doing? All good, all good. Every time I speak to you, Roy, we're always talking about your fighters. <laughs> and We don't really talk about you as such, but you know, we talk about um, different fights coming up. It's almost the same old thing, so I wanted to try something a little bit different here. Okay. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but we are going to ease you into a little bit of uh, boxing talk at the start. Do you, do you remember like the first point in your life where boxing was a thing, like your first ever memory of, yeah, 19, of boxing? I, I want to say it was 1974 maybe. My dad was watching Muhammad Ali Joe Frazier and my dad was completely overtaken by Muhammad Ali. You know, he thought Muhammad Ali was the best thing since sliced bread, you know? And uh, I was like, wow. And so I started watching, and as I'm watching, I'm like, well, what he's doing mentally to Joe Frazier, I can do that because I love to aggravate people. I just need somebody to teach me how to use my hands because I'm the best agitator I ever met at five years old. Yeah. But I need to know how to use my hands and I can do exactly what he's doing. So from that point forward, I wanted to box. Do you remember the first ever fight you went to? Went to, I don't remember the first one I went to, but I know the first one I had, I went, I went to a fight at the Navy base in Pensacola. And uh, the guy was too big, so we did an exhibition. And uh, I went pretty good. So two weeks later, we went to a fight on Pensacola Beach, Labor Day weekend. And they asked me, uh, would I fight the guy for real? I said, why not? <laughs> you know, I mean, I just fought him in an exhibition. He was about 14 pounds heavier than me, but I'm like, why not? So. I fought him and I won, and I was like, from that point, I was hooked. Mm. But I mean, even before you had your fight, I had going to fight. No, I, had no, I was only like 10 when I had my first fight. I had yeah. never been to a fight before. Oh, really? Never ever. So your first fight was at 10, yeah? Yeah, at 10. Wow. Yeah. Many moons ago? Yes. Um, a lot of people, when they ask, well, and I speak to boxers and they say, I ask them, like, who was the first person? There's always one boxer that got them into boxing or got them interested in boxing. A lot of people use you as their reference of kind of their first fight, but for yourself, who was that one person that kind of maybe got you into watching boxing in the first place? My dad got me into watching, yeah. but, but Muhammad Ali was the guy that got me interested in boxing. Mm. When I saw Muhammad Ali and I saw how, how much my father was taken by what Muhammad was doing, that, I was like, I can do that if somebody teach me how to punch. So obviously, when you talk about people like um, Muhammad Ali, because I always ask people when, if you're not born in the era, like when I was, I was born in 1981, so mm -hmm. everything I've seen of Muhammad Ali has always been through tapes because mm -hmm. he had his last fight in 1981. Right. So I think there is a difference there, isn't there, between it is, it is. being a, around in someone's era yeah. to watching reruns and tapes and stuff. Exactly, it's, it's definitely a difference. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. Like people now, they know LeBron, but they didn't see Michael. Yeah. I saw Michael. I know the difference. I can't argue with them because they don't know. Yeah. They only know what they've seen. They didn't get to watch full games of Michael Jordan. Yeah. Kids never watched a full game of Barry Sanders yeah. running a football. They know more though. Don't nobody do it like Barry did. Yeah. Don't nobody do it like Michael did. Kobe came close, but nobody does it like Michael did. But you have to be able to watch the games to actually see. Now you go back and watch full tape, full games, you might understand, but it still be hard because you're watching with your mind already fixed on something else. And you don't understand the importance maybe of the game at the time. You understand me? You don't understand the importance of him pushing Bill Russell with the crossover at the same time, coming over hitting that shot. I mean, not, I mean, what Russell, what's the boy's name was? What the Utah Jazz, not Bill Russell, but uh, I forgot his name. But he pushed him and come up and hit that shot. You don't realize the importance of that happening in Utah at that time. Yeah. You, understand? you understand? So, but you do understand that like when LeBron came back from three to one down with Golden State and won that, you understand that if you're born in this time, because you got a chance to be there and live and see and know all the things that surrounded that. You don't know all the stuff that surrounded when he pushed Russell and made that jump shot. So it kind of takes away. 
You understand me? Whereas if you watch it with an open mind, you could get it, but not many people are going to do that. Mm. Do you ever think about, um, obviously it's difficult for you to probably answer this, but if you weren't involved in boxing, do you ever think about where or what you'd be doing now? No, I don't. <clears throat> I'd probably be playing basketball, or I'd probably play basketball or play football. I wouldn't play baseball, but I'd play basketball or football. And I would give my try, and you know, who knows what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. But boxing kept me out of trouble, gave me a way of life, um, taught me discipline, taught me a lot of things. Yeah. And I'm thankful to God for all he taught me through boxing. But whatever it is, you believe you'd be in some sort of sporting capacity? Because I refuse to not be first. I gotta find a way to win. <laughs> you understand me? I refuse to not be first. If I do it, I gotta figure out how to win it. If I don't figure out how to win it, I don't wanna do it. So I don't play golf because I know I'd be out there all day trying to figure out how to win. And I don't take enough, it don't, it don't do enough of my adrenaline to just hit the ball in the hole. I wanna hit somebody in the face. <laughs> You know so I mean? with, with that attitude, do you think whatever you decided to do, whether it was something like um, a different sport, you think you would have been as successful as you were in the boxing? Of course I would have, because I'd have given my all 24-7 until I got there. Mm. You know, when I first started boxing, I was okay, don't get me wrong, but um, you got to remember, I was the type of guy that I believe in what God put me here to do. So my first national tournament, I got disqualified the year before in the region because my father got me there late and I didn't make weight, right? So I got disqualified. That was the first time I realized that people cared about my existence in boxing because the people that represented my region were highly disappointed because I wasn't representing them. That was the first time I ever felt a sense of responsibility. And when I felt that sense of responsibility, it drove me so hard that you gotta remember, I was born from the country. I didn't know what a national tournament really was. The next year, because I owe these people, I went back, won the district, won the regional, first time ever going to a national tournament, realizing what it was, and won that too. And won the most outstanding boxer in the middle class. That's how determined I am when I make up my mind. As a child, you said you, um, 10, 10 was the first mm -hmm. uh, time you, you got in the ring mm -hmm. uh, in that sort of capacity. Uh, outside of the ring, do you remember uh, the first ever fight you got into? No, I had quite a few fights. Yeah. One <laughs> that sticks in your brain? The one that sticks in my brain was, I was um, in the first grade, and uh, all of us, everybody in the class, there was this kid, he was bigger than us, he had glasses, he had very tight, nappy hair, and he had big teeth. And he was taller than all of us. And he was mean. And all of us feared him. Everybody in the class, I think the teacher even feared him. And he was in just the first grade. So what age is that? Huh? What age was that? Ah, first guy I had about six. Six, maybe seven. I think it was six. Yeah. So, and he may have even failed a year, I'm not sure, but he may have been held back a year already because he was bigger than all of us. So one day I came to school and as I was getting off the bus. And how do people notice about me? I don't know. But I was, oh, I know why this time, because I, I was liking the little girl that, they, that he had slept with. All right. right. So they came in and said, hey, his name was Rodney Clark. i never forget it. They said, Rodney just slapped Siobhan. Rodney did what? He slapped Siobhan. Off the bus, I go straight to Rodney. Now, we all normally are afraid of Rodney, but Rodney hit this girl that I happen to like. Right at Rodney's glasses. <laughs> Bang! Rodney's glasses shatter. Rodney loses, lose control, start crying. Up to my, and they send us to the, well, they send him to the office. The teacher told him, send me to the office. She's so happy, I punched him in his face that she left me alone. <laughs> win, win, yeah. That's it. You know, win, so, win. And I never had no problems up to that. But. Did you ever get in touch back with Rodney Clark? I, I grew up knowing Rodney. Yeah? Rodney had a totally different respect for me from that point forward. Yeah, I bet he did. Yeah, I, know Rodney, I know Rodney today still. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Do you guys ever talk about that moment? Nah, I, respect. I just had to do what I had to do, but he was, I mean, I went on to become a world boxer, so what are you going to say about it now, you know? <laughs> well, that could be his claim to fame, to be honest with you. That's true, that's true, but. Yeah. Man, no, um, do you remember a point in your life where you felt you were fighting a losing battle? Not necessarily in boxing, but just in your life. Yeah, at, uh, at, at about 14 when I got disqualified from that tournament, I felt I was fighting a losing battle. Then again, when I went to the Olympics and beat the hell out of the Korean and they gave it to him anyway, what you boxing for? 
You beat the hell out of a man, they give it to him anyway. Any, any other sport, and I said this on the interview, I said, any other sport, you cross the finish line first, you win. And boxing ain't the case. You cross the finish line first, you still suck. <laughs> That's not how you should have. How did you deal with that? Do you it, it was rough because I didn't, I didn't quite understand it at first, right? But a few days, as the days went by, I started to realize that if you have faith and you know who God is, God can turn any situation around. And I started to realize that, you know what? This could be a blessing in disguise. People coming here to talk to me, not the guys that want to go with medals, they come to talk to me. How could he possibly have already made me bigger than the guys that wanted to go? I thought I wanted a gold medal. <laughs> but now in the hindsight, I'm kind of glad I didn't get a gold medal. Because I became bigger than everybody who wanted a gold medal. So God took my faithfulness and used that worst point of my life, I thought, and made it the best point of my life. But it's called having faith. It's difficult, I was supposed to see it at the time, but... Mm, about three days. It about, took me about three days because you got to think about it. You train nine years to prepare yourself for this one moment, and then they cheat you out of that moment. Nine years of sacrifice and dedication. I'm talking about no family reunions, no Christmas holidays hardly, no nothing. I had to train through everything. I didn't get family vacations. I didn't go to Disney World, thank God, but I didn't go to Disney World. I didn't go to my family reunions too often, maybe one or two here and there. I didn't get to go on family vacations. I don't know what nothing that meant. <laughs> it was boxing. For you now, um, you're still very active in boxing, mm -hmm. obviously not on the actual in the ring side, but you're very active now. But uh, aside from your, the boxing stuff in your life, what are the everyday battles for Roy Jones in your life when you wake up in the morning? What are they, either mentally or physically, what are the, the everyday battles for you? The everyday battle now is to just try to keep yourself in some form of condition and shape because you got to remember your whole life is built around being an athlete. So. When you see people, you don't want people to see that you have given up that regimen of having some self-respect for yourself. You don't want to be walking around sloppy, uh, too big and overweight. Then how are you going to tell them that this is the way you're supposed to live your life? Uh, an athlete should live as an athlete his entire life. Just like a monk lives as a monk his entire life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you should live as what you are your entire life if you can. Now, if you've got a disease that stops it, that's, that's kind of different, different and understandable. But if there's nothing to stop you but you and yourself, then you should be able to deal with yourself enough to keep yourself in shape enough to be able to tell and teach guys. One thing I like about training fighters is they'll tell you that I can give them a perfect example of what I want to see. Mm -hmm. If I can't give you an example, then how I'm gonna, everybody can tell it to you, but who can give you the example? Who can show it to you? Because sometimes people don't get it, just the words don't translate to what it really is. But when you can show it to them, Get over here and copy me for a minute. When they copy, then you go back and explain to them, again, uh, to them again. Then they understand what and why they're doing it. Does that always work? Not always, but most 95% of the time it does. I got a few cats that won't understand it. There's a guy named Andrew Murphy. No matter what you tell him, it's going to take him time before he gets it. You understand know I me? Mean? There's a guy named Fernando Bunch. He's going to do it like 2,000 times before he get it right. There's a guy named Shady Gamora. He gonna see it, go back home to Sweden and call you in three months and say, I got it now. <laughs> so everybody had their own way of doing it. There's a guy named Tony Curtis. He gonna understand it all perfect for the first three rounds, but the fourth round, he gonna be back doing what he was doing the first round. Mm -hmm. So they all got their ways of getting it, but you gotta know who all you're dealing with. Kevin Newman, he could do it perfect mm -hmm. in the gym, but when I put him in the light sometime, his mind kind of goes other places. Not that they can't do it, they all get it. They just gotta know how to put it together at the right time. So some of them, like I said, some of them be, um, they'll do it, but they, they can't do it at the right time all the time. My goal is to make them know how to do it, do it so much that it comes automatic. Mm -hmm. And that's why I stay on them. But I love it because what I teach is very high tech. I don't expect them to be able to get it that quick like that which makes me get them more rounds of doing it, which is what I want them to do anyway, because that's how I learned. I didn't learn by just doing it one time. I had to be doing it over and over and over and over. And that don't mean I got it right the next fight. I still had to do it over and over and over again. But when I kept doing it over and over and over and over, I finally get it. 
and that's what they're understanding. So you're, the way you've learned is being implemented into them? I mean, if, I, if it taught me that way, then how, what other way do I know to teach somebody for sure that works? Right? Yeah. I don't know how much of an emotional person you are, but when's the last time you've had to fight back tears in your life? Ah, most times I have to fight back tears when people pass. You know what I'm saying? When I, somebody dies, it's really hard for me. And what's bad is, is like, even if somebody dies that's close to somebody that I know, when I see the person that I know hurt, it's hard for me to fight that back. I'm a very emotional person, so you know, it's, it's kind of hard for me. Um, when Chris lost his brother, that was hard for me, and I wasn't even over here. Mm -hmm. but that was hard for me because I know what the family felt. You know what I mean? That's, that's very difficult because I feel like I'm part of the family now because I train. So it's very hard for me when I see that, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, could, I get what you're saying because sometimes you might not know someone directly, but the person you're close to, you see it's their hurt. grief. And that hurts So me. that's, that's yeah. the pain. Yeah. But for you as a, a person, this next question is not really like in terms of physicalities, but your fight spirit, where does that come from? Um, I think, you know, we all have something that God gives us at birth. You understand me? And whether we understand it, learn it, or know it or not, some people will learn it early, some people learn it late in life. But God gives us all special talents. So whatever our special talent is, we have to find something that we can relate to to help us move that talent forward. You feel me? So for me, as a young kid, anything that will fight, I used to love. I used to catch bees and put them in the jar just to see them fight. I used to catch frogs, put them in the jar, catch grasshoppers and feed just to see them eat them. I used to always study nature and animals that fight or animals that devour other animals because I wanted to see what tactics they use to devour the other animals. You understand me? So nature taught me how to be a fighter, but also how to know how to attack something. You understand me? And with that being said, it's like I learned quickly that I was a hunter. You understand me? A guy that wanted to compete. I wanted to be an alpha. And I learned that right away. Is that something you've developed yourself in your life? Is it had, has your dad had input in that? I'm assuming he has. I'm sure he did too yeah. because he was that kind of person. Mm. So, and he was the one who taught me about the game roosters, taught me about the pigs, taught me about the cows. He taught me about a lot of animals first. So when I learned about these animals, I started figuring out which ones characteristics, characteristics I liked or which characteristics, characteristics I liked about those particular animals. Wow, I did not know this. Is yeah. yourself, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm learning now as well, myself. But um, for yourself, uh, Roy, as well, do you, have you had to fight demons in your life? Yeah, you had to fight demons. Um, I had to fight several demons in my life, you know. Um, it's kind of hard because, like, when you fight, you, you have to deal with, first of all, the biggest demon is the yourself. Fighting yourself to make weight, fighting yourself to stay focused, fight yourself to not go out and party or go out and do things with women when you know that you got a fight coming up, you know, but the biggest demons probably are the demon of me and my father not being able to get along. That's probably my biggest demon. How is that situation? Still the same. He's a lion, I'm a lion. But listen, but look at it like this, this is what you have to understand. I had to understand this way. Some animals remain part of the family for life. Other animals, like a lion, when he gets a certain age, he did tell them, okay, now, you gotta go. Why you gotta go? Because you're a lion. You gotta go be a lion. You can't be a lion in, under this lion. This lion is the lion here. You gotta go be a lion somewhere else. And that's what you have to realize. So I understand it now, and now it's so much clearer to me because I understand nature. Everybody isn't gonna be the same. You understand me? I mean, you gotta think about a horse, and people don't know this either, but a horse. In the wild, a horse has his whole family, right? If a male stud comes and wants his daughter, that stud gotta fight him. So he can know that that stud can fight before he allows that stud to take his daughter. You understand it? That, that stud, that don't, sense, that stud yeah. don't fight him and show that he can fight, he ain't getting his daughter. That's that, but that's nature. So you have to understand what part of nature relates to you. Because God made everything including the nature. God made all the animals. He made all the people, all the trees, all the animals, the fish of the sea, he made everything. 
So what part of it can you use to relate to yourself? What characteristics of that particular animal can you use to relate to yourself? It's like I tell people all the time. I know you know Isaac Chalimba, right? Yeah. I told Isaac Chalimba, if you realize what you are, you would have been a lot better fighter. Because in reality, you're a hyena or a wild dog. You know what I mean? What a wild dog does, the wild dog is not that powerful like a lion. He's not fast like a cheetah. But he can go all day long. They run you 30 miles, run you down, then they weigh you up. But they, they ain't got the biggest, sharpest teeth. They ain't the strongest animal, but they gonna stay on you. That's how Isaac fight. Isaac's not the best puncher. He takes a good punch, but he's not the best puncher. But he can go all day. If he would've figured it out early in his career, he'd have had a different career. But nobody was around to help him figure it out. You use a lot of references and comparisons to nature and, and animals. Is this something that you implement in boxing and in life as well? Of course. Yeah. Of course, you have to. God gave us that. Who gonna be better or smarter than God? <laughs> you understand me? So if you're not gonna use what God gave you, how big of an idiot are you? In my, in my opinion. You say that that's the blueprint there for us to follow? There it is. There it is. That's why I tell people when they come to the gym, even people like AJ, say, you come to my gym, I'm not here to teach you to fight like me. I'm here to figure out what are your best characteristics? What is your DNA? How do we better your DNA? You understand? Everybody here is different. You know, everybody around boxing is different. Everybody has different DNA. Now, there are guys with a similar DNA. You know what I'm saying? You're going to find two guys like Tank and um, the guy he fought the short guy, Pitbull. Yeah. They're kind of similar. Just the Tank has a little more boxing Bruce. skills. Bruce? Yeah. yeah. Tank got a few more boxing skills than Pitbull got. But they kind of, their fight mentality is kind of the same. So there you're going to have two Pitbulls. Which Pitbull will be the smarter? During your, whether it's your fighting career or just in your, in your life over the years, have you ever had to fight depression? Depression, no. No. I never fought depression, no. The uh, reason I never fought depression is because throughout my life as a kid, I was always depressed. I stayed depressed because my daddy kept his thumb on me so hard. I lived through depression my whole time. You understand me? So once I got to be an adult and got free of that, I'm so happy to be free. I can't be depressed anymore because I know what it's like to live under that thumb and be depressed. I was depressed my whole childhood. To what to about 18, 19. Really? Yeah. Is it something at that age you did see yourself getting out of, or you saw, did you see that light at the end of the tunnel? Or? Only, God, only God showed me that I could get out of that one day. You know, God would show me different things, give me different signs, and tell me, just keep going, you're going to be all right. That's so why I would keep going, because I believe in what God showed me. So you said till 18, so those years after that, it, did, it wasn't ever a factor in your life? Mm, no, because once I got 18, I went to the Olympics at 19. When I came back from the Olympics, I was about to sign with the main steward to get away from it all. But my mom talked me into giving him a few, another chance, talked to giving my dad another chance. So it's okay. So I gave my dad another chance from 88, from 89 to 92. 92 is the same thing, not knowing I wasn't depressed anymore no because I knew I had the right to do whatever I wanted to do at that point. But it was kind of similar. You know, you not understand that you can't talk to me like I'm a kid no more. I'm a grown man now. You know, you thinking that you got to have every say so in everything I do. That can't happen no more. I'm a grown man now. You understand me? Yeah. I have my own stuff. I have my own women, my own things. You can't dictate everything no more because I'm becoming my own lion. And sure enough, he kept trying to do the same things and it just didn't work. So at some point it got to where I was ready to kill. And I said, no, that's God telling me it's time to go. But I always asked that God would show me, give me signs, let me know when it was time to leave. And God did. Do you believe in that everything happens for a reason? Without a question. Yeah. It's a bit of a, a well-used cliche, but I, I'm a believer of, mm -hmm. you might not see what that reason is at the start, but there most, is always a reason. Most of the time I don't see the reason, but I know it is. <laughs> And I believe what God tells me. So when I hear him tell me to do it, I do it. Perfect example. People don't know this, right? My main coach throughout my career was Alter Merkson after me and my father separated in 92, right? Yeah. So me and Alter, every title I won, main titles I won was with Alter Merkson, right? People didn't know that he was the alternate coach 
the assistant of my Olympic team, right? In 1988, before I left the Olympics, you know what I told him? Give me your number and stay in touch. Let's stay in touch because one day I'm going to need you. In 1992, you know what I called him and told him? Go. I said, you remember the day I told you one day I was going to need you? He said, yeah. I said, well, that day has come. And that's how that happened. So wow. tell me, I don't listen to what God tell me. Wow. <laughs> people don't know that about me, though. Wow. People think, uh, he shouldn't do this. He... People don't understand. Y'all don't know. Y'all just like me. We live up under God's rule. We don't know. Y'all don't know no more than I know. But when he tells me, but listen. So something he told me, it was something about that's got to be God talking to me. You get along with this guy, get his number, because you might need him again. So I got his number. And I told him just that. And he believed and gave it to me. So, that's what it is. That easily could have not happened as well. And then easily. Easily, yeah. And then I never would have probably been where it's on, because all I needed was somebody to help me make sure I'm in the gym every day, help me make sure I'm on time, an army guy that'll make sure I'm on time and at the gym. That's all I need. All I need is somebody to make sure I'm there. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do if I'm there. Just make sure I'm there. Because if I ain't there, I ain't going to do it. But if I'm there, I'm going to do it. If I come in here, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Just get me in here every day. And that's what he was able to do. And I knew that when I first met him. Because that's what he was. He organized everything for us in training. He set up the whole training camp for us and everything. He wasn't the head coach. He was an assistant. Yeah. But he did all the hard work, all the real work he did. So I said, you know what? He kind of, and he never tried to change me in training. He always let me be me in training. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? This guy right here is a perfect guy if I ever get to where I need a trainer. Because he ain't trying to change me. He let me do what I do. And that's what I need. You fight for your family and community and people around you. Who fights for you? Who's got your back outside of a boxing environment? Who's there for Roy Jones? Whether it's uh, outside of boxing, Bobby. Outside of boxing, I got an uncle named Fred. Yeah, Uncle Fred is and has always been my best friend in life. And uh, my uncle Fred is my like he kind of you know I like to say when God when one door closes, God opens ten more. Is that like when the door closed, me and my father, the door had already opened me and my uncle. <laughs> so my whole life, my uncle been more like my big brother. You feel me? Yeah. He and I share a lot of the same thoughts. So my Uncle Fred is like, I go, even today, when I'm home, every day I go see my Uncle Fred because we're going to have something to talk and joke and laugh about. I'm a big fan of laughter. Anybody that knows me will tell you that I'm a huge fan of laughter. Uh, I love to laugh because laugh is, laughing is good for the soul. You can't laugh, then you're not really alive. You feel me? Yeah. Laugh and love, laughter and love are the two best things going. If you can love people, love yourself, and you can laugh, then you got something. And that's what you get from your Uncle Fred? My Uncle Fred always keeps me laughing. And I keep him laughing as well. So. Do you go to him for advice? Yeah, if I need to. Yes. Does he go to you for advice? Of course he does. It's a two-way street. Two-way street, yeah. yeah. And he's a lot older. He's probably about 18 to 20 years older than me, but still a two-way street. We respect one another as men. So because we have the same respect for one another. It is what it is. If you've got a problem, who do you call? Fred. Call Fred as well. Mm -hmm. He's a man for all occasions and for you. Everything. But now, because, like I said, I've came over here to the UK now and learning my new friend and this guy, Tony Curtis Sr. over here, I can call him too. Yeah. The hell of a guy. Yeah. Um, all right, final question here. Um, Roy, I'll answer this in whatever uh, aspect you want. What, what still drives that fight within you? What when makes that? you get up? What drives that fight that you have inside you? Um, what makes you get up in the morning and the to do, carry on doing what you're doing? The fact that God gave me life. You know, there are people that are incarcerated. There are people that in beds that can't get up and go no more. There are people with cancer with different diseases that can't go about no more. If you're one of those people, you'll be laying out wishing would give anything to get up and go one day. But he gave you that. So why would you lay around and not get up and go? You understand me? Yeah. You have to learn how to take the negatives of the world and use them to put a positive spin on it. You ain't bedridden. Yeah, your knees hurt, but that's all. Get your behind it, but let's go. 
<laughs> you understand? You got kids that want to learn how to fight. You got these guys that want to learn how to box. You got these guys that help need a little inspiration to teach them how to become the next them. They watch you as a kid. They want to be something of what you were. Yeah. You got all the tools to help them get where they want to go. Why would you not give that to them? Would God be happy for you to take all that and put it in your bag and go to sleep on it? Or would God rather you go try to give it to as many of them as you can? I think God would prefer that I go give it to as many of them as I can. Because now when the day comes to an end, what did you do in life? Well, I don't know what I did, but I know what I tried to do. <laughs> you know? It's true, isn't it? It isn't. If you try to do something, you can't like go said, with any regrets. I don't know what I did, but I know what I tried to do. My intent was to give as much back as I could because I appreciate what he gave to me. Do you regret anything in your life? Regret anything? Um, because of the way the world is, I probably regret that I didn't stop after I won, after I beat Tarver the first time. Because mm. now it would definitely be, it wouldn't be too much of an argument who's the greatest fighter of all time. But I couldn't go down like that. That's just not who I am. It's not in my DNA. <laughs> so that never would have happened. As much as, much as I regret it, that never would have happened. Because it's just not who, you can't put a fight out there and say, this guy can beat you and I don't go fight. You gotta, he got to show me. I'm sorry, but that's just what it is. Okay, well, Mr. Roy Jones Jr., thank you very much for coming on Raw the Fight Within podcast. Uh, yeah, it's been interesting because, like I said, we talk about the same stuff every time hey. you're around. It's good to kind of get some sort of different perspective of you and your life. So, yes, busy period for you coming up, which we'll uh, talk about in due course. But, yes, Mr. Jones Jr., thank you very much for thank you, brother. talking to Raw. Appreciate it, brother. Thank good you. Man. I'm gonna share something with y'all. That might put me in a very negative light, yeah. Relationships are not my forte. You see if someone grabbed up my wife for saying completely different ball game. I'll walk away from here and this has been like a therapy session.